I have to laugh because this is a true story that I had happen recent where my GPS only holds 5,000 numbers. Right. <laughs> so, you know, I'm trying to figure out what to do and how to deal because I have others that I need to, you know, because I'm constantly saving new spot. Anyway, I'm having to literally go in and like delete. I don't need that. I don't, need, I don't go there anymore. Delete, delete to create enough more space to add more space. So right. I totally understand what you're saying. It's kind of fun. <laughs> This is the Tom Rowland Podcast. Fascinating stories to amaze, encourage, and inspire you in fishing, fitness, and the outdoors. And we're brought to you by Black Rifle Coffee. I started this podcast as a way to connect with my friends, people that I admire and respect, and you. It has been a learning journey that's made me a better person, a better fisherman, a better father, and a better athlete. I'm so happy that you're on this journey with me, and I'd love to hear from you with show suggestions, guest suggestions, or questions. The best way to get a hold of me is through text. You can text 305-930-7346 for the fastest response, but if you prefer to email, you can send that to podcast at saltwaterexperience.com. That's a dedicated email address just for the show. If you like this show, you can show your support by posting about it on social media and tagging me. Text the link to a couple of friends that may also enjoy it and subscribe and leave a five-star review if you feel like I've earned it. The website is TomRollandPodcast.com, and that is where everything lives. All past shows, you can go and listen to any show. You can look up all the different shows that we've done, both the How To Tuesdays, the Full Links, and the Physical Fridays. They all live on TomRollandPodcast.com, and the social media is Tom underscore Roland, R-O-W-L-A-N-D, on Instagram, or You can go to our big account, saltwater underscore experience. I hope to hear from you soon. So now let's get on to today's show. Good afternoon. This is Captain Jeff Malone on Tom Rowland's podcast. Jeff Malone, how you doing, buddy? Doing great, Tom. How about yourself? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. What do you got going on today? Rainy day? Well, a super rainy day down here, so just doing a few honeydews around the house, just right. uh, kind of enjoying a day on the dry land. And that's not uh, very frequent for you. <laughs> no, sir. It's very, very <laughs> uncommon for me to be on the on the hard ground for sure. How many days a year do you think you're guiding? Good golly, I, if I had to guess, Tom, I, I would guess I'm probably pretty quickly approaching the 300 mark, something around there. So 300 days, but then you also do multiple trips a day. So in 300 days, how many trips would you do? Good golly. I would, I would have to guess it's North of there a little bit. I would think, you know, um, I mean, I haven't done the Sometimes you're doing three trips a day, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I haven't sat down to do the math recently, but you know, I figure if I'm doing that many days, I I mean, gosh, that's, that's enough. You know, it's a lot. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it's a lot, you know, yeah. you're, you are definitely one of the hardest working guides that I've, that I've ever seen. And I got a tremendous amount of respect for you because you just, you just go, man, you're just on this grind and I've been watching it for years and years and years. And you have, you show no signs of slowing down, like no, well, no signs of slowing down. I don't know. I'm getting, I mean, I'll be honest as the years are going on now, I'm certainly full and starting to really make me aware that I'm not a young man anymore. I'm getting older and, you know, I'm starting to feel some of the aches and pains of it, you know, uh, yeah. particularly with the daily net throw. And that's really starting to take its toll. Um, you know, for many, many years, I, I just assumed that, you know, that was never going to be the case. And unfortunately I'm not Superman. I'm not invincible. I'm just a mortal fishing guide. So, <laughs> you know, unfortunately the years are starting to, starting to take its toll. What have you had to do to, to, um, allow that type of activity in your life? Like most, you know, a lot of people think, you know, you're going to be a fishing guide. You're just going to, you know, go out there and it's going to be super easy. But the way that the Florida Keys fishing guides do it, whether you're a skiff guide or center console guide or an offshore guide, it's incredibly physical. And that's what a lot of people don't, Um, realize about the profession is that it's really a lot like I've always compared it to being a professional athlete, because if you're a professional athlete, you make your living on your body. If your body doesn't work, 
you can't go play. And if you can't play, you're not making any money. And, you know, like say a rodeo cowboy, they get injured. They've got to go somewhere and they've got to do it again tomorrow night. And that's the same way with a fishing guide. If you hurt your back, if you do anything, like, I don't know, you have, you, you drop a cooler on your foot. If you do whatever the next day, you either go and get paid Man or up. you don't. Right. So yeah. like, what, do you, what, what is that to you? Like, what, have you done some things that have allowed you to, to, um, fish more days or than you used to, or do you, how do you take care of yourself? You know, I think one of the really important things that I've discovered is, is really diet and how you, how you feed your body, you know, uh, in the early years, uh, you know, I just ate junk quite frankly, uh, just in, you know, and as I got older, I just needed more, I needed demanded more out of my body that the junk wasn't giving me what I needed back in return. So I just noticed, uh, you know, when you, when you rely on your body to make a living, you notice that there's a direct correlation between what you put in your body and what comes back out of it. Cause you're, you're seeing the instant results of it now. Um, whereas when you're younger, you don't really think about it. You're just putting something in there to get an instant gratification to your body, but you don't necessarily notice the uh, effect of what you put in right away as when you get older, you notice, yep, I need something better in my system than say, uh, you know, junk, you, you know, right. you need something a little, a little better for your body. And that's what a lot of the customers bring. Like a lot of the customers, certainly my customers would bring me lunch and it's like, Oh, that's super nice. But they're on vacation. They're bringing whatever they want to eat. It's not what they would normally eat. You know, they're, they're right. getting like whatever they want, cookies sure. and sandwiches sure. and soft drinks and, and, and right. teas with, you know, tons of sugar and stuff in them. And, and they bring all this stuff. And, and that's right. fine, like every now and then, but as the guy that's out there 300 days a year, like, man, you, if that's what you're eating every day, you, you it doesn't, it doesn't work. But no. the funny thing about you though, is that you tend to drop weight. Like, I mean, I, I, I'll see you in the beginning of tarpon season, the middle of tarpon season, at the end of tarpon season. And you, you get to where you, 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 you've really shaved. <laughs> Shed a lot of weight. You look like a skeleton at the end of the of the tarpon season. So I mean, uh, everybody has like different different things with diet. Like some people put on weight really easy, but some people it's it's tough to put on weight or keep weight on. It seems like for you, when you're working that much, you're not getting enough food because you you definitely oh, lose weight. How much weight? Well, do you think there, you there's lose? The, oh gosh, I would I would guess probably. You know, I'm not a big guy to begin with, Tom. So soaking wet, you know, I'm 150 pounds. So, mm -hmm. you know, I would guess I probably lose a good 20 pounds or so during tarpon <laughs> season, just because let's face it, you know, in the middle of the afternoon in, in June, there's nothing that sounds good to eat in the blistering sun. There's right. not, I mean, you know, so I'm lucky to just get some cold fluids in me because that's what I want. I'm not hungry. I don't want to sit down and eat a cheeseburger. I just want something cold to drink. So I focus on trying not to get dehydrated most importantly. And then if I can sneak a little something in just to keep me going, I will, but um, it, it's a tough thing. You know, it's tough to find food that you want to eat in, in under those conditions. So it's a challenge, you know, and then on the top of it, I'm going, I'm never just sitting around waiting for, waiting for something to happen. I'm always trying to make something happen. So I'm not one to sit idly aside and take a break and sit down and just eat. I, that's just not my personality. That's not how I roll. I, you know, I'm constantly trying to be, and then of course, you know, once in a while I will get hooked up with a big tarp and I'll get to fight him for a little while. And I'll get a chance to sit back and, and give myself some nutrition for a minute, but I don't make it a priority. Right. My customers, my fishing, what I do every day is my priority. And if you get dehydrated over the, over the years, when you, when you have gotten uh, more dehydrated or whatever, like you say, that's a priority. That was one of the things for me that I noticed if I was paying attention to my hydration, my energy level through the day was, was a little bit better, but by the end of the week, it was way better by the end, you know, and then I could go like two weeks straight and then three weeks straight. But if that hydration level, I always thought it was like, it, it didn't happen on a day where you just, Oh, I got super dehydrated. It was like this slow kind of, it was like you had a little little leak in your tank. And then, then at the end of the, you know, end of four or five days, 
you just feel terrible. You're, you're really There's no doubt. I mean, it's something you got to be careful of, particularly in the heat down here. It's cra- It's hot and it's humid and you don't even recognize how quickly you're losing, you know, the fluid out of your body from, from sweating and working and just roasting in the sun all the time. So it's, it's something you really got to be careful. Of, Do you have sure. an amount of water that you try to drink a day? much as I can, <laughs> but I'm, I'm bad about it, Tom. I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I would say I'm dehydrated more than I'm not just because I can't put enough fluid in my system. I just can't, I try, I try to drink, but again, there again, I don't make myself a priority. I'm, I'm focused on what I'm trying to do. And, and sadly it's sort of the sacrifice I've made to my body and myself and my mind, because I, my priority is doing my job, not taking care of myself, which isn't necessarily a good thing, but that's just the harsh reality of my lifestyle. You're a consummate um, entertainer, you know, like you, you put the customer first and, and I've always noticed that about you. Um, what do you think your favorite uh, style of fishing is? You do a lot of different kinds of fishing, basically every, oh, every type uh, of fishing, but I do, I do a lot of fishing, a lot of styles and types of fishing, but you know, Tom, I mean, for me personally, I really enjoy fly fishing myself. I mean, I do, I really enjoy it. Now I didn't say I enjoy guiding it. I said, I, <laughs> I enjoy, I enjoy it. You asked me specifically what I like to do. I like to go fly fishing. Um, now guiding it, I look, I, you know, it's what I am. It's what I do. I, I enjoy my customers and, and showing me a nice time, but guiding fly fishermen has its own unique challenges, as you know. Um, For sure. so, so I'm not saying that I would put that at the top of my list in terms of what I enjoy guiding, but I really like fly fishing a lot. It's hard. It's hard not to, um, I enjoy the challenge of it. Let's face it. I mean, I can accept going out all day and not catching a fish. Gosh, I catch plenty of fish. I'm good. I don't, Oh, I didn't catch one today. Ooh, well <laughs> I caught 80 snook yesterday. So I'm probably good for a minute. You understand what yeah. I mean? So yeah. I think that's what I enjoy about the fly game is I like the challenge of the bite. And, uh, I think to me, that's really, and I enjoy casting. Let's face it. I mean, most of us fly, fly casters, enjoy the, the casting part of it as much as anything you make a good cast it feels like you caught a hundred pound tarp and i mean right so you know i think that's the joy of it for some of us you know what species if you if you were to you you get the rare day off you're going to go fly fishing what species would be your preference i mean it's hard it's really tough to uh to beat the old fat the tarpons i love them i mean right. i do it every day as a matter of fact you know there's times even when my wife just kind of shakes her head like i don't even understand at all like you <laughs> <laughs> you've been out there every single day and now you get a free few minutes to go out there and you want to you really <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but what I mean that that's what that's the passion, that's what drives. And and so for that, are you more interested when 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 that kind of feeling is is overwhelms you and you're like, "No, man, I got to go." I mean, I got to go to check this out. Are you going to to check it out like to maybe learn something or to to just check and see if something that you thought was happening is actually happening or is it like now, I don't get very much time and this is my time and this is something that I want to do. I want to go catch a tarpon. Like, what? You know, that's that's tough because sometimes, you know, there's a good example. Last year, we had a situation where I had a few minutes and it was right around sunset at seven mile worms going off. And for some way or other, I made it. Uh, there was a reason I had to bring the boat by the seven mile bridge for however that worked out. I had to, I just had to run by there real fast. So, of course, I get there and they're they're going off and I, I've got to launch a couple of them real quick. They're boiling. They're eating worms like crazy. I'm like, I just drop the anchor over, make a cast, got him on, you know? Um, and in that process, we learn too, because, you know, let's face it. You, if you spend that much time out there, you're constantly paying attention to what's going on. You're bound to learn. You're, you're going to learn, you know, and, and over the, all the years, it's just building blocks of learning so that, ultimately it turns into sort of your bag of tricks because those little pieces have built up to this massive, you know, uh, pile of tricks. So, you know, when you really get in, into a struggle situation or you're, you're challenged, um, you can kind of dig down in there and go, well, under this condition, what, where would be my best, you know, opportunity here. Mm -hmm. And that's where, you know, an experienced guy is beneficial because he's got a big bag of tricks to kind of dig into and say, well, gosh, on this last cold front situation, this is where it was going off. And chances are because they're, you know, the fish creatures habit, 
they, you know, generally will repeat those same patterns. Right. And that's what I, I find the one of the most interesting and exciting parts about fishing in saltwater, but it, particularly in fishing in the Florida Keys, because we've got all these different tidal differences and you've got you've got wind and temperature and and then the tide. But there are many opportunities for you to replicate or try to replicate something that you just saw before. So when you're doing that kind of replication or thinking in your head, do you have you kept any kind of a, a journal, any kind of a written thing? Do you do you do any of that or is it all up there? I really there? don't. I really don't, Tom. I've, I've considered it over the years. And quite frankly, um, I think the reason I really haven't done that, I guess most importantly, because I do it every day. I'm right. in it. I'm plugged into the system every single day. So I don't have to go. I mean. I, the seasons change and I just change with it. And I'm out there so much. You're literally plugged into the ecosystem. You know what's happening, how it's changing around you and you're watching it daily. So I just, I really don't. And, you know, um, I'm not saying that it wouldn't be beneficial to me as I get older and I don't not, not you know, remember quite as well, <laughs> <laughs> but, but uh, I like to think that, you know, to some degree, you know, the, some of the enjoyment I get out of this is, is kind of unlocking that puzzle and figuring out, you know, what the deal is. And I think that to some degree, there's times I don't necessarily want to know, let yeah. me go figure it out. You know, I mean, if I had a playbook of this is where exactly where I have to go and exactly what I have to do, at what point is it, you're not even really fishing anymore. I mean, I'm afraid of the days where you turn on your GPS and it shows you where every school of redfish is. It shows you where every pack of tarpons at. It shows you where every school of permits located. And I'm afraid that it, 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 at some point that might just be the case. It you know, be. you get to your spot, you launch a drone and sit back and all right, where are they? They're at 24, 52, whatever. And there they are. Like that's, I don't know. I enjoy the thrill of, figuring it out, you know, the thrill of the hunt, you know, let's face it. I mean, once you get there and you got them dialed, it's fun after your first 80th snook, <laughs> but the joy of it really was figuring it out. Yeah. Right. You know, and, and, and kind of pat yourself on the back, like good call, good call. Yeah. Do you, know, you still, with, with all the time that you've spent out there and all the, the, the different situations, are you still running into situations that, that blow you away and things that just, that you're just like, man, I thought that might be the case and you worked it out. Maybe you checked it a couple of times and it wasn't happening. And then something was just slightly different and you go check it out and it happens. Like, does yes, that still happen a to you? It does. As a matter of fact, it happened recently to me um, where, you know, I had a suspicion that this one particular spot was going to be um, was going to be good. And uh, oddly enough, um, this particular location had changed due to a it storm changed. or what? Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. It changed it. Excuse me. And it changed it for the better. I said I looked at it and I said, gosh this is going to be good. <laughs> this is going to be really good. And, uh, we went there and my customers were absolutely blown away. It was, it was really good. And it was all, you know, not all in fact, but partially due to the change of the spot, it changed and it changed, it created a better environment than was previously there. So, you know, that was just one of those situations. I just call up. We got lucky. I mean, I didn't change it. It changed. Right. And fortunately I knew what it was before and they just adapted to the change in a positive way, created a better environment for them. And we were able to capitalize on that. So, yeah, I mean, you know, and I guess that's part of why, you know, with the whole, like keeping track of the notes and everything, you, that's not going to help you. Right. You know what I mean? So to some degree, I, I think it would be neat, like to go back and look at some of that stuff, but uh, in terms of like, you know, keeping track of the barometric pressure and the water temperature and the tide that particular day. Well, heck, if I'm going to go back there five years from now, chances are something's going to be different. Right. It's not going to be the same barometric pressure. It's not going to be the same water temperature. It's not going to be the same tide, probably. Uh, so to some degree, I, you know, you have to adapt almost on your fishing day or your whatever that time allocated to go. It's not often going to be the cookie cutter day you had last week. 
Right. It's not. I mean, I do it enough to tell you, I go three times a day sometimes and it's different every time, you yeah. know, it's, you know what I mean? Yeah, so, for sure. Do you ever, so, uh, you know, sometimes I, it'll be, you know, I don't, I don't fish as much as I used to. So it's, it's easier for me where I used to like, I'd go, I go to a spot and I'm pulling around on the spot or looking at the spot. I'm like, man, I used to come here all the time. Like what happened? Like, why did I stop coming here? Because it's still good, but you find yourself in one of these places where you haven't been there in two years. And you're like, whatever happened that I stopped coming here? Do you know what I'm talking about? Like I do. And then you, then you, then it becomes back into, into something that you do on a regular basis. And then I guess, I guess part of it is that there's just so much time in the day. There's just so many days in the year and you're accumulating all this knowledge and all these spots over, over time. And some of them are going to fall by the wayside. They might still be fantastic spots, but there's some reason that you just stop going there. Right. Like, absolutely. Absolutely. No, that's the truth. I have places that I can put in my mind right now that I used to do really, really well. And why I don't go there anymore. It's just, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm sure that they're, they're as good as they ever were under the right circumstances, mm-hmm. the tides, right. The time of day is right. And so forth conditions, you know, and I think that's the condition thing, you know, is huge too, because gosh, one place that's, that's excellent on a certain condition is not the same on a different condition. Mm-hmm. And we see it and experience it all the time, you know, right. Oh, can we catch a perm today? I don't know. So it's, it's so they're super conditional in my opinion, the conditions, right. It's full on. Yes. So one conditional change game over. And it's that way, I think, with our permits, our bonefish, our carbon, red hot because the condition's right. The next day, something changes, game over. It could be simple as a wind direction change, game over, just like that. And I think that's a challenge sometimes for people to understand that that's, in fact, the case. You know, a lot of our fishing is conditional. So here again, you know, you, you know, you, you almost have to approach it on a daily basis because what's Mother Nature have for us? Right. You know? Yeah. When we're talking about um, all the the record keeping and all that stuff, I remember people used to, you know, I I, I mentioned this the other day on the podcast, but I would be at Sugarloaf or whatever. And like, who's that guy over there? It's like, oh, that's Steve Huff. You know, that guy's forgotten more than you're ever going to know. And like, wow, that's (laughs) I, I don't. I don't know how that's possible that somebody could forget more than I'm ever going to know. But then, then you hear these stories about like all the stuff he had done and you're like, well, maybe, maybe it is. But what really starts to hit home is when you get older and it's like what we're talking about here. It's like, Oh yeah, that spot over there. Yeah. I hadn't been in there in 10 years. I used to go there all the time, but I hadn't been there in 10 years. It's still good. Oh, that's cool. You know, I forgot about that spot. Right. And what do you think about that? Do you think somebody could, do you think that you've forgotten like, I mean, maybe you have to be reminded, but what do you, what do you think about that? Could you have forgotten a ton of knowledge and replaced it with other, like, like the Simpsons. You remember there was a Simpsons <laughs> thing where, where Homer, in order to put something new into his head, he had to get something else out. Like there's only so much room in here. Right. So <laughs> I have to laugh. I have to laugh because this is a true story that I had happen recent where my GPS only holds 5,000 numbers. Right. <laughs> So, you know, I'm trying to figure out what to do and how to deal because I have others that I need to, you know, because I'm constantly saving new spot. Anyway, I'm having to literally go in and like delete. I don't need that. I don't need, I don't go there anymore. Delete, delete to create enough more space to add more space. So right. I totally understand what you're saying. It's kind of fun. <laughs> but uh, getting back to your point, I, you know, whether I've forgotten, uh, you know, I don't, that's hard to say. I, I you know. I don't know that I've necessarily forgotten stuff, but um, because most of the good stuff is still pretty, pretty at the top of my mind, but overall, um, I don't know, Tom, that's, that's a tough question. You know, I don't, I, 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 you know, yeah. Um, When you're talking about things that change, like the, I mean, we've had a lot of change in the Florida Keys. We've had cold fronts that have changed things, had storms that have changed things, um, all kinds of things, different, different regulations have changed more boats, less boats, hurricanes, lots of change. Some, some good, some bad, like what, and, and in some years you'll see a lot more of a certain fish than maybe you ever have before. And then another year you're kind of like, man, it's been really tough to catch whatever. Like, what do you think have in recent times, what do you think has been like a positive 
what have we seen more of? What have you seen more of? Or what opportunities have happened more? Gosh, well, you know, I was really um, devastated back in 2010 when we had our uh, that real bad fish kill that we had. And uh, that was something that I had never witnessed to that scale before. Mm-hmm. I mean, that was no joke. You were I mean, seeing killed, that with all what, what species? It, I mean, it killed, well, the, the snook really took it real bad. I mean, they, they, they took a licking, but, um, as did, you know, all of our, our, our tropical hogfish, bonefish, um, even some of the snapper and parrotfish and stuff, um, took a licking, but back to the point, I mean, I drove up to Everglades national park a couple of days there, maybe three days or so after that real bad cold in 2010. As did, I'm sure a bunch of local guides did. And uh, I, I had never in my life seen that many snook belly up. I mean, it was sad. it was truly a sad, one of the most disheartening things I've ever seen. It was mm-hmm. bad. But fast forward to now, and it, it that snook fishery there now is better than I've ever seen it. I mean, it's absolutely unbelievable. You catch them anywhere and everywhere. I you don't even have to fish for them when you're catching them. I mean, it's it's it has really, really come back strong. Um, you know, and I think that, uh, overall as a whole, the fishery managers are doing a pretty good job in terms of, you know, the snappers and groupers that are so heavily targeted, you know, with, um, you know, we're doing really well with them. I think that they're doing pretty well because of some of the regulations. Uh, personally, I'm a big fan of the slot limits. I think they're fabulous. Um, I do believe we need to be, you know, we should be allowed to buy, say, a trophy harvest tag for the case of a world record, um, you know, because as it stands right now, you can't catch a world record redfish or world record snook because you can't keep them they're too big. Um, so, but in my opinion, I, I, the slot thing's great. I think that those big spawning fish need to go off and spawn. I mean, let's face it, um, you know, as well as I do that, you know, if you're going to eat a, a grouper, I'd rather have a 15 pound grouper than an 85 pound grouper. Certainly. Yeah. Right. I mean, I don't want to eat an 80 pound snapper. Yeah. I mean, let those kubaras grow up and they're super fun. They're cool fish, but really those are the ones we need to eat. Or are you going to take a picture and bring them back to the dock? Because look what I caught today. I mean, right. So in my opinion, that the slot thing is pretty cool. What did you notice with the, with the change in the slot with the triple tail? Uh, well, I mean, it hasn't been all that long now, Tom. So, um, there's definitely quality fish to be caught out there but they're still growing you know Mm -hmm. what i mean because for a long time there it was i think it was 16 inches or some 15 16 inches so there's still going to be a minute before they start you start catching a lot more of those you know 17 and a half 18s you know Mm -hmm. i mean there's still a lot of little ones around from what i've seen it Um, seems like there's more though it seems there's a lot oh my gosh holy moly it's like it seems like for whatever reason maybe it is the uh it is the regulation change or maybe that's a coincidence that maybe that happened as well as some natural phenomenon or whatever i like to point to the regulation change because that seems like if it worked for that then let's let's do that for other fish right and sure and, and for you know fishing guides and the people that like to go fishing it's way better because they're more targets and they're better fish, better quality fish. It's awesome, right? Um, Absolutely. But it, do, it it certainly seems like there are more. Like maybe that that when you bump the the slot up, it allowed for more spawning fish or something happened because there are a lot more, well, in, my, in my opinion. And every, everybody that I talk to is like, wow, triple tail everywhere. Like It is. It's a fabulous fishery too. I mean, it's a sight cast fishery almost anywhere that you are in the state of Florida, you see them, you cast to them and more often than not, they're going to eat it. So what a great sport fish and not to mention they're excellent to eat. So you're right though. The numbers of those are just really, really good. Good And then the yellow jack, what do you think happened with the yellow jack? Like why did all of a sudden there's like an explosion of, of yellow jacks? You have any explanation for that? I don't. I would be lying to even tell you. I, I, I like that. I nope. mean, listen, listen, listen. I mean, I'm not, you know, um, a, a, a friend of mine on his, on his truck, on the back of his pickup truck, it says guide, not God. And I just love it. I it mentally resort to that regularly because sometimes my clients look at me like I'm this entity above being a fishing guide. I'm like, I, I don't know. I, yeah, You got me. I mean, probably one of the more comical uh, situations I had fishing one day 
we were tarpon fishing and um, we were using a float cork with a, I don't, I think it was a pilchard. It was, and in any event swimming down this bar is a giant bull shark. He's four or 500 pounds, full grown. And she says to me, Jeff, um, he's, will he eat our pilchard? I said, no, they don't, you know, they don't really have a big desire to <laughs> pursue a pilchard, you know, my experience immediately he does a 90 degree u-turn straight towards our float cork eats the float cork eats the pilchard swims away and she looks at me and she says they don't they don't eat pilchards huh I was like, <laughs> apparently they love them apparently they love them they go out of their way for them yeah it's almost yeah. like as soon as you say something is not going to happen no that, that, that they're not going to do that bam it happens and then it happens again and again and again and you're like what i don't know right. and, and then it yeah. never happens again like no, ever it's no, it's crazy. I had a friend of mine. I told him, do not cast that school of bonefish. They were swimming away from us at 80 miles an hour. I was like, don't even waste your time. Throws it as far as he can, jigs it one time and catches one. I'm like, of course you did. Of course you did. Because I told you not to. You make a Hail Mary, however far you could throw that little jig head, jig, jig, jig with shrimp on it and catch one. <laughs> that always that seems to always happen with the, with the guy that you you, you kind of didn't jive with right away, you know, and he's kind of feeling you out. Like, I wonder if this guy knows anything and then something like that happens. And then for the rest of the day, you're trying to make up for, uh, like, like that situation. Like, hmm. yeah. Yeah. And I've had, I've had some not so good ones, you know, where, you know, I told a client not to cast at this school. We were fly casting for bonefish. I told him not to cast at this school of fish coming to us. I would have sworn it was a school of, of big kudas and we watched the school of bonefish swim under my boat they were jumbos every one of them and I, <laughs> he looked at me i looked at him and he's like those were not barracudas i said nope they weren't <laughs> they were not barracudas <laughs> so my credibility very quickly took a nosedive but you know sometimes that's how you learn and you live and you learn and you know, when you're, when you're at, um, I mean, you're making, you're living out of Hawks Keg and you're, you've been fishing there for so long. And of, of course you've, you've high graded your clientele at this point, but at some point you were taking a lot of people that you had never seen before. You had never met any, any you'd never met before. And that, sure. that little situation that you just talked about, about your credibility, just going down, like, how do you, how do you recover from that? What do you have to do to gain that, that confidence back from that guy? You know, the feeling I'm talking about, about, oh, this guy's doubting me. Like they're doubting me now. Like I, right. I said the wrong thing or the wrong thing happened, you know, like we're talking about, it's totally out of your control or whatever, but your, your credibility plummets. How do you, how yeah, do you see, deal with that? See, in the early days, it, it was, it was, it was more difficult because you had to really push on to prove that you were using the right fly you had the right leader you you know that you're able to control the boat in a manner that he can deliver the fly to the fish that you can actually see the fit you know it gets easier as time goes on because you're more confident in your own ability so you don't doubt yourself but in the early years you know you have a little bit of self-doubt and that can really start to wear on you but as as you get older and you you know you've done it over the years um, you know, it certainly gets a little bit easier because I'll just shrug it off any, anymore and just laugh about it because, well, I'm just so confident in my ability and my knowledge and everything that I know that I'm just human. I can make a mistake. Sorry. Right. Yeah. I thought it was a school of kudas. Well, we'll hopefully then we'll throw the next school of kudas we see. We're going to cast at them. <laughs> they bite or fly off and tie another one on. Yeah. But by golly, we're going to cast it. Whatever swims at us next time, you know, but I've had enough cases, Tom, over the years where, the reverse is true. I had a client one day who was, you know, he, I could feel he was starting to really sort of doubt, you know, that we were, we were permit fishing and he got to a point where he, so I could feel like he was starting to doubt what was up. I said, Oh my God, there he is. He said, oh boy. Here we go. I said, I swear to God, he's right in front of the boat. <laughs> throw your crab right now. He's like, I don't see anything. Jeff. I said, just throw the crab 50 feet, 12 o'clock. And he, and he told me later, he said, Jeff, I swear, I thought you were just pulling some guide business that you saw something I didn't see. He catches a monster permit. I don't know, it's 40 pounds or something, but he, and so built my credibility because he's like, holy macro, man, you weren't joking. I said, I don't joke about what I do out there every day. I'm, I'm on it. I, you know, I'm not out there to jerk you around or, you know, but it just so happened he was suspended deep enough. He couldn't see him. He was, I don't know, he was probably four foot down, three and a half feet down just hanging out on, on, on a lobster trap or something. And uh, he just never saw him. I said, dude, throw your, throw him up there and 
fish came up off the bottom. He's like, Oh my gosh. I said, yeah, there he is. And, and, and we caught him. So I've had a lot of cases in the past of that, where the, the, you know, you build your credibility with your customers because they start to believe in you, you know, driving along and then stop and do a U-turn. What did you lose your hat? No, there's a triple tail right there. Once we're driving along 30 miles an hour. What do you mean you saw a triple tail? I'm like, well, I'm looking for them. Right. So yeah, there they are. And then you pull up and there he is. They're like, okay. So you start to, you know, over time build that, but, uh, Again, it's gotten easier over the years, for sure. Yeah, I mean, it, when you when you have that confidence in yourself, you know what? You know, the funny thing is, is like what you're talking about. The the confidence from the angler probably hasn't changed, but what changed is that you have more confidence in yourself, and you know that you can say, "Hey, shows you what I know," you know, or make a joke about it, or be like, eh, you know, like. A lot more fun were, now. Yeah. You think so? Is it getting more fun every year? Yeah, absolutely. It's getting more fun for sure. Because I don't have that. There's no doubt on my side. I'm good. I'm covered. I'm all set. I mean, everything I got to do on my part is covered. So when you jump him off and you didn't bow, because I told you 500 times, I mean, I don't know what you want me to do. I mean, I'm not going to catch him for you. Right. You know, so... Do you still it's get just, nervous before charters? People, any any charter, never nervous. No, I wouldn't say never, but I don't get very no, not usually. Only time I ever get nervous is with you guys on the film program. <laughs> that's, that's I, I don't know why. Some of the best shows we've ever filmed have been with you. We did have one nerve, tough day. We had one tough the, day. That's nerve wracking, though, man. You got because you, there's a lot going on. You got there's just a lot happening. You know, there's a lot of people that are relying on you to make it happen and it's stressful. So yeah, yeah I mean, I get, well, you know, well. there's drones flying, there's other cam there's <laughs> camera boat, there's four other guys with cameras like, all right, Captain Jeff, what are we going to do? It's like, holy moly. I don't know. I just, <laughs> this is a, that is a, a very, wrong. very, very difficult situation to explain to someone. It's also a very, very difficult situation for some guides to, to be in because like you, you are, like you say, you're, you know, you're moving all the time. We're going to catch bait and we're going here. And if we're going to be here for 30 seconds, if we don't see something, we're out of here. And you've got a plan in your head that's materializing. And I can see it, man. I can see your wheels are turning. And when we first, the first show we ever did with you, I was like, this might be tough for Jeff. Like <laughs> it's also, it, it could also be tough for like anybody that fishes tournaments regularly or, or like is, is just, is just got, got the program and they are on it. And it's like, no, this is a real slow moving ship and it's hard to turn and everything that you want to do can, can be done, but it's going to take five times as long. And that's right. a tough, and that's, one. it is a tough one. It is, it is. And, and, you know, like you said, it's a slow turning ship. It's not, all right, let's go. Well, wait a minute. You, all these guys got to put away all their equipment. We got to get two boats ready to go to another spot. It's like, well, uh Oh, froze up. I hope I didn't lose you. There you go. There we gotcha. go. Sorry about that. Yeah, no problem. Sorry about you that. said you said you got to get two boats to go to to. Um, well, yeah. I mean, it's just like you like you had said. I mean, the slow the slow turning ship. I mean, it takes time to to get everybody ready, and it's just you just have to think a lot slower pace. You have to really kind of step back and say, okay, maybe I need to stay here a few more minutes because in order to pack that boat up and all those guys and our camera equipment to run over here. And run over here. It's like, wait, we got to do a different yeah. program. You so. know, that's why, like, it, when I'm ever talking to somebody that we've never filmed before, I'm like, listen, you got to just take us straight to the meat. Like, just straight Don't. to the meat. Because, <laughs> like, a, a fishing guide rarely does that. Like, okay. Or, or I wouldn't. When when I'm making the plan for the day, I've got, sure. like, okay, this is the A spot. So, I want to go there when the light is right. And I don't want to go there too early. You know, I want to make sure that I'm hitting this at the perfect time. And it's like... You know, so so we're gonna check a couple of spots where I don't really expect to catch much. Maybe we do, maybe we don't, but we're gonna make our way and the day is gonna kind of build to this spot. And sometimes that spot is the first spot you hit because of the, you know, it's an early morning spot or something like that. But mostly it's gonna be like, you know, you're building the day around like these few couple of spots that you think, well, that's you know. They've been there for a week. They're going to be there today. Like this is everything's perfect. The weather's nice, but it's kind of like when you're doing the show. It's kind of like 
that's where we need to go immediately, <laughs> you know, because it's going to take us longer to get there. You didn't realize that we're going to do 40 minutes of running shots and, you know, you're planning on trying to get there at 11. Yeah. That's even if we go as fast as we possibly can, that's about the time we're going to get there. So just take us straight to the meat. <laughs> do you uh, like the, do you like the film thing? It's fun. It's a lot of fun. It's a nice change up from my daily. So yeah, I would say it's a lot of fun. It's just, like I said, it's a little bit stressful just because of all that, you know, but uh, at the end of the day, I think it's a lot of fun. Yeah. It's one of the craziest uh, and best memories of the, of, of shooting uh, comes from you. Like we, we went at right after a hurricane, it it was right after, um, not sure which hurricane it was, but um, we, we fished with you, man. And you took us to catch a tarpon in the morning, right at the bridge. No surprise. It was good. We had bait, everything. You were all prepared. You knew exactly where they were going to be, or we were trying to catch a tarpon. Maybe we caught a jack or something, but then we go back just to the flat right in front of Hawks K, the, what we call the resort flat. And man, it's like, okay, well, we're going to, you know, the water's still muddy from the hurricane and we're going to, we're going to do this and, and we're, we might catch a couple of bonefish and man, no bueno. <laughs> we just started catching permit and it was, it was awesome. And, uh, and you just, it was one of those things where kind of like what we're talking about, where I'm, I'm like trying to envision what it is that we're going to do. And yeah, we're going to chum for bonefish and stuff. And then you're like, no, man, it could, it could happen. We could get a permit here. And I'm like, you catch them like here like that, like just chumming for them. Yeah. Every, every now and then, then we caught like five like that and no bonefish, <laughs> like, <laughs> but it was just a cool cool thing and and you know the way that you were fishing that jig you you were pretty being pretty aggressive with the jig on the permit you know for 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 the way that i fish you're like putting it right on their head and they were eating it but i find that to be the case after hurricanes do you that that like fish are like the hurricane can be the worst thing for the human population in the florida keys right but it almost always benefits the fish in my opinion like it. Yeah, I think, and I, and I could be wrong, but I think that a lot of times they sense the barometric pressure dropping. So they'll feed heavy prior to it. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And then they'll go hunker down, whether that's running out into the Gulf somewhere deep or out in the ocean. Um, but after, you know, and they feed ravenously prior to that kind of a blow. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that to some degree, their feed is based on the severity of the low pressure. So they sense a super heavy low, they feed rap, like they'll chew the back of the boat apart to get, they know that they're gonna have to hunker down for a prolonged period of time. Whereas say a a average cold front, it's not as big of a a pressure change. They'll feed prior to, but knowing that it's gonna be short term. But when a big hurricane comes, they go, they, you know, they eat, feed heavy, and then they got to lay low for, gosh, weeks it could be, you know? Uh, and then when they, when, when, when it's time to get back after it, boy, they are eating, eating, biting, biting. Yeah. And especially as that water is clearing, like, you know, the, right after the hurricane, the entire ocean is chocolate milk, uh, shallow water, deep water, everything's chocolate, chocolate milk. Like it's just got, got, it's like flushing a toilet, like just everything got stirred up and then you'll get a few tide changes and then you'll start to see that water just start to start to clear up a little bit. And then the tide will come back in or go out and whichever one, one of them will make it muddy again. Then one of them will clear it up again. And then the incoming tidal, you know, you'll just start to see this water just start clearing up. And when that gets kind of to this perfect condition, that's when I've seen like they will chew the back of the boat off. Like they, it's clear enough for them to see all what they want to eat and they don't, care like what's going no they yeah yeah and you have a lot less you know you don't have much pressure on the fisheries either really then you know i mean gosh after uh irma there wasn't pressure on our fisheries for at least a year right you know anyone that had anything any kind of interest here in terms of a house or a business they were working on their house or their business or with contractors or the insurance company or they weren't out goofing around. Trust me. I mean, I, I fished through it all and there was a lot of days I was just driving around out there by myself because everybody who was wrapped up in their, you know, property. Yeah. Management but you can, take you can get, you know, a few or enough uh, customers down to, to, to be fishing every day. 
that's true. That's true. During that time, uh, it was pretty quiet for a minute. Yeah. But, but I, you know, I, I had some folks that wanted to go fishing, so that's what I do. Yeah. And, you know, <laughs> thanks to you guys, you know, I mean, y'all, I mean, I got to give credit where credit is due. I mean, you guys have helped a lot. I mean, let's face it. I mean, you, you know, put me out in front of the world to say, Hey, this guy goes fishing. People look up and say, wow, we could go fishing with that guy. Yeah. But Give you've done, try. you've done, I mean, maybe, maybe there's a little bit of that going on, but man, when they get with you, you don't expect to, don't expect to get them back because, um, you're, you're, you're a professional. I mean, that's the one you're, you're one of the hardest working guides that I've ever seen. And you're, you, you like, you take guiding to an art form. That's what I think of. I think there's certain people that, and it could be in any profession, right? You could be a banker that takes banking to an art form. You could be a, an insurance salesman that takes it to an art form. Like everything that you think about every single day is how can I be better at what I'm doing? How can I clean my boat better? How can I have better tackle? How can I know where the bait is better? Like how, how can I do better? I see that clearly from you. Where do you think that comes from for you? Um, I think it's just, uh, really a, just an inside drive to never be good enough, no matter what. I mean, there's always room to improve. And I, I think just mentally for me, I want to be as good as I can possibly be. Uh, and I think a lot of that has to do with, um, uh, respect for my customers because they're investing a lot in me. Uh, they're, they're, they're taking time out of their life to come spend with me. And it's also a financial obligation. And a lot of them are, you know, booking me really far in advance in some cases. So the least I can do when these people come fly in here to spend time with me is give them 110%. No, no nonsense. Oh, my boat's not working today because I didn't maintain it. Oh, I'm sorry. That reel screwed up. I didn't put a new line on it. It's all crap. I mean, this is stuff I can control. So I try my best to give everybody 110% because I feel that that's what they're entitled to. You know, you get a professional, whatever. I don't care if it's a professional golf caddy. Don't tell me to tee off with a putter. Right. I mean, you know, I don't know. You got to help me here. So I want to in turn, I want to give my clients 110% because that's what I do. How, how do you measure, this. how do you measure success in your mind? You measure success like your own success like how do you know like this has been a great year this is this is was a great day this was whatever how what do you what in your mind is a successful trip happy customers that's the bottom line i want to make sure that everybody that goes fishing with me had one of the best times they've ever had fishing that's my goal i want them to walk away and not it was a mediocre time like wow okay whether we did or I don't, I don't measure it by what we caught. That's not how I measure it. Because if you put your soul on the line for the end result, which was hundred pound tarpon, uh, you're going to miss most of the reason we even go out there. <laughs> you know, I tell my customers all the time, like if, if the, if the ultimate bottom line is we have to catch a hundred pound tarpon for your happiness, you're with the wrong dude. Cause uh, that's you're going to miss all of the sea turtles and the stingrays and the spinner sharks and the cool stuff that we see happen out there, which is the whole reason we go out there. Now, granted, we use the excuse we're going tarpon fishing. Okay. But at the end of the day, most of us go out there for heck. Most of the time my day is made just watching the sun come up. And if you don't appreciate that part of what we do out there, you're probably not my customer because my customers enjoy all of it. They love riding around there, seeing the turtles, seeing the wildlife. Naturally, the goal is to catch a bunch of fish. That's the goal. Let's face it. That's what I do. That's what I love to do. That's my goal. But uh, there's way more to it than that. So I judge it by making sure that my clients, A, have had the time of their life, and B, they want to go with me again. Because you're not going to be a successful guy if you don't got clients to take them again and again and again. So I've got a number of clients that I've had for a long time, 20 years plus, that continue to come back to me and want to go again. So I think the measure for me is just people having a good time. And if you're not having a great time with me, there's a bunch of other guides. Go with them. There's a bunch of other ones, you know, so give them a try and see if they can provide a better experience for you. But I can assure you, I've done all my homework with the best I can provide you with the boat, 
the equipment, the knowledge. I'm going to give you 110%. And I think that's all I can do. It makes me sleep night, good at night knowing that I did that. So. That's awesome, man. That's, that's, that's really, I, I love that, how you said that. And it's very similar to the way that I, I thought about it too, is like, you, you certainly, you're, you're trying to catch all the fish that you can and stuff like that. But there are plenty of people that caught more fish than I did, but maybe their customers didn't like them. They were grumpy about it. They were, they'd get upset if somebody missed a fish. So you can go out and you can catch, you know, 400 pound tarpon. But if the guy yells at you on the last one, because you didn't bow and it, it ruins the whole day. And it's like, you could go out with the same person and have a slightly different attitude and have a little more uh, entertainment value and also be nice to his wife and you know keep a keep a clean boat and everything and maybe catch two tarpon and it's the best day they've ever had catch no tarpon not even see one that's when you know like if you can take somebody out there and you don't see any fish and they come back and they say it's the best day they've ever had it's fantastic and they want to go with you again yeah we have to book this again next year we're going to come back in fact we'd like to come in the summer and the winter like we want to make this two trips right that's 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 success, right? But success is success is obvious um, when you know. First of all, there's a benchmark of 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 days. If you can get around, you know, anywhere between two seventy five and three hundred days, first of all, you're a madman. Secondly, you probably need some sort of counseling as well, as well as a physical <laughs> therapist to uh, a physical therapist to to get all the 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 knots and 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 injuries out of your body, but. It, it speaks volumes and I've, I've mentioned it lately uh, because it's been on my mind, but the 300 day mark is, is a big one for the guide because there's a lot of times of the year where you don't, it, it, trips just aren't flowing, right? It's a hard time of the year. There are not as many tourists around, whatever. Um, the fishing is, is not as well known like tarpon season or, you know, some sailfish season or whatever, there's like a big draw. It's not around spring break or, or fall break or whenever the kids get out of school, there's these, like these off times. And in order to have the 300 days, you got to fill all those off times and you got to have way more than 300 people that want to go fishing with you. You got to have lots and lots because most of them all want to go at the same time what they've heard right. about tarpon season, whatever, but it also speaks volumes about the, the, the place that you choose to, to make your living. And that's the Florida keys because the, th what we have there is so special in the, in the, in the species that we have in the variety of different places that we can fish for them in the tidal differences between flamingo and the ocean side and the, lower keys and, and the ocean side and all these different things that, that you can throw all this amazing combination of, of, of fishing days together. Like you have 10 different guys go out from the same dock and there's 10 completely different days, right? You have one guy that goes and catches a bonefish and then runs out there and catches a sailfish. Cool. That's nice. It's possible. You can do that. You have another guy that goes straight to Flamingo. And he catches, you know, snook and redfish, and maybe maybe he could even go into the freshwater and catch a bass. Then you got another guy that heads down to the to the lower keys and does something different. And you, it, it's just such an incredibly uh, diverse diverse ecosystem. place. Like, <laughs> what do you think about that? Like, how lucky you are that you uh, that I can are go in the, the Florida country. Keys? Yes. Oh my God! Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I mean, the reality of it is, you can start in the morning in the back country where the crocodiles are catching snook. By afternoon, you could be dropping for swords 30 miles offshore. I mean, so you have it in everything in between from the reef to the Gulf Stream to Florida Bay, Gulf of Mexico, Everglades, all within a probably a 60 mile area all right here. Yeah. So it's it's a blessing. Let's face it. I mean, we have some of the best there is in terms of access to a variety of fisheries. I mean, it's really it's really cool. Would you, was there ever a, a, a way that you might not have ended up in the keys? How did you, how did you start guiding in the keys? So I was fishing for uh, spiny lobsters down here. So we were doing that. I had a lobster business. So I was fishing spiny lobsters and um, you know, quite frankly, I had somebody contact me about doing a guide trip when I was um, 
when I was lobster fishing, because I was always fly fishing at the time. I had a 15 foot Willie Roberts. Flats, oh, yeah. wooden, oh, nice. Wooden flats yeah, I know so that. I, would, I mean, yes. my, one of my customers had one of those. It was all, yeah. he had redone it and all. It was amazing. It was a great little boat. And I would always just go out and fly fish for fun. I enjoyed it. It was, my, it was kind of like my own little time out mentally. And so I got a, con- a call one time to take somebody out. They wanted me to take them fishing. I said, well, I don't, that's not, I don't really do that. They're like, well, look, we'll pay you to take us and uh, we'll pay for your gas and we'll bring some beer. I said, well, you know, I'm not, it's not really what I do, but uh, you know, you're gonna, I said, well, we might not catch anything. They're like, yeah, yeah, we know. I'm like, wait a minute. So you're going to pay for them with the gas. You're going to pay me. You're going to, well, I don't have to catch anything. They're like, yeah. I said, shoot, man, we'll give that a shot. So <laughs> <laughs> we went out and had a great time and, you know, it, it really kind of started from there. And then, uh, you know, that's, it, they told somebody who told somebody who told somebody and that's kind of how it started. Um, and then at some point, naturally, I said, gosh, I need to get it together in terms of, you know, having a license and having insurance and, you know, doing it legit. And uh, that was some years back. But uh, and then, so, and then that, at I some got the point invitation. To, oh, go ahead. You got the I was going to say, then, 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 then I got the invitation to go to Hawks K. Um, so when that opportunity came about, that was a game changer. I mean, that was a game changer more so than I ever imagined it being a game changer. I mean, it really, it really just brought people to me that I never had because I was operating out of my house. So I just never really had the, you know, exposure. I was, you know, that I'd wait for that one person to tell somebody else and they would call me, but it could be months, you know I mean? So it took a lot of years to have a calendar, a schedule. I mean, gosh, it took a solid 10 years just to have enough work to even stay alive. I mean, it, you know, that's what. So during those, be. those 10 years, would you continue to, to lobster or would you? Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. It worked out good. Yeah. I just was getting my butt kicked by the darn hurricanes. You know, they'd come in and blow away all my equipment. And I'm like, Hmm, this is tough, tough deal. So my hat's off to all the guys that continue to do that to this day. Cause that's a lot. That's what I do is tough, but that's next level. Yeah, it is. Stone, stone crab too, you know. I mean that, that all that stuff. Usually the lobster guys they 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 probably do stone crab in the off season. I mean, people that kind of make their living like that are kind of doing a little bit of everything, like every everything that they possibly can. I mean, I'm sure you have the the big lobster guys that that's that's they specialize in that. That's what they do. They got more equipment than anybody, but you know, you'll see a lot of a lot of like independent kind of people that make their living on the ocean and you know, maybe they spearfish some, maybe they, maybe they, uh, you know, stone crab, maybe they lobster, maybe they, whatever, collect because that's what, fish. that's what it takes. Yeah. That's what it takes. I mean, that's really, in order to make a living in, in, in this, this environment, that's really what it takes. You have to be willing to do whatever it takes. I mean, whether you're bully netting and you're guiding or you're, you know, it's, you know, it's really something that, you know, we love it. So we're going to figure out how to do it. And I've been blessed to just do one job. Because most guys are doing at least two jobs. They're whatever that is, whether they're bartending and guiding or they're guiding and they're, you know, crawfishing or they're stone crab. I mean, most guys are doing more than just guiding just to keep, you know, there's not enough business, like you mentioned earlier, year round to keep a guide service going exclusively that all year round. It's, it's, it's hard, you know, and without, um, the support of my wife, let's face it. There's no way I could spend that kind of time out there with our children and the house and the bills. And the, I mean, doing all that is required to, to run a life. I mean, I've been blessed that she's been able and willing to help with a lot of the gosh bookings and reservations and all of that. So, yeah, well, you get on an awesome job with it. Um, have you ever had anything super weird happen out there? All Super your guiding. Weird. Yeah, I don't know. Weird, weird catch. Weird, what's the strength? If someone were to ask you what one of the one or two of the strangest things that you've ever seen or had happen to you while in the course of guiding, what would you say? Uh, well, one of the more interesting um, <clears throat> stories I have was I had a gentleman, uh, a large gentleman fall overboard. And this was um, quite a case. Uh, so we were, we were fishing not too far from shore. So you, I don't want you to picture this being that we were in Flamingo, but the kind of the long story of it was he fell in. I couldn't get him on the boat. So, uh, it went from comical to, Oh my gosh, he's going to drown. 
Cause like now he's completely spent and he's in the water and I can't, we can't get him in the boat. And I'm like throwing him every floatable device on my boat. I mean, every life jacket, floatable cushion, the whole nine. And, uh, finally I just, I got the situation secure where he's at least now floating. He's breathing. He's alive. But now what I had to throw him a rope and tow him to shore because I had no other options. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then when he gets to shore, can he step in the boat at that point? Yeah, I mean, he's yeah, be yeah. Completely yeah. exhausted. Yeah, he was, but it was a, it was a kind of a dire situation. Like I, you know, I, I, I mean, I, I, it was a very challenging situation. Let's say that because it went from, Oh my gosh, it was a little bit comical at first. And then it escalated very quickly. And, uh, you know, I was able to stabilize the situation and then, um, ultimately tow him to shore to get him back in my, my boat. But, how do you handle the, how do you handle the ride home? Oh, he was good. He was good. He was fine. He was wet and a little bit, you know, it's one of those situations where I think his, his pride was a little hurt, but you know, Safe. You know, but, yeah. Yeah. But that was one of the more interesting, uh, situations, I think in terms of just, you know, like a unique thing we may have caught. Uh, probably one of the more unique fish. I know it's not unique to fishing, but for us here in the Florida Keys, we caught a ribbon fish. Mm. Where do you catch that? What depth of water? <laughs> what are you doing? Where do you catch that? Uh, as a matter of fact, we were fishing um, on the ocean side, trying to catch some ladyfish. It was a big school of ladyfish, and we were just having a ball catching them. And my customer reeled his hand. They, they're like, "What in the world is this?" And I said, "I looked at it. And I'm like, honestly, I." think it's a ribbon fish because i've only ever seen pictures right. of them i've never caught right. one and i said i think i'm pretty sure it's a ribbon fish but th- if you've never caught one they're quite interesting creature super shiny it's super shiny super eel like some funky teeth and this weird dorsal fin that's super crystal clear that goes from its nose to its tail weird looking critter but you know in fact i took a picture of it and sent it to a friend of mine in uh, south carolina and he said yeah man that's we they catch them on topwater plugs frequently. Yeah. There's like a place them. where they catch a lot of them. I don't know. Maybe it's South Carolina. I don't know, but the, the Kingfish guys will. Yeah. Will they use those. them. They troll them. Right. And, right. and I don't know where they get them, but it's not the Florida Keys. I don't think. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> if it is, I don't know where they catch them because I've only ever caught one. So. Well, they're apparently a, they're good bait because they're so shiny, I think, is one of the things that they're just. Yeah, and they're long and eel-like, so they probably troll them real good. And, you know, if you put multiple hooks in that thing, I'm sure the kingfish would eat them up. But yeah. uh, that was one of the more unique things we've caught, you know. That's cool. Every every guide's got some, you know, I'm, I'm sure we could probably continue to talk and, and a few other stories would come up. But you got just just weird things happen out there and things, you know, just when you think, you know, you might have seen it all. There's something that you're just like, huh, never seen that before. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, like, you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> of course. Yeah. Yeah. And that's kind of the excitement for us to go out there every day because you don't know what's going to happen. You know, I mean, I had a, 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 a guy walk down the dock one day, he said to me, he said, so captain, do you guarantee I looked at him. I said, I guarantee I'll try to bring you back. How about that? I mean, <laughs> what? I don't have a crystal ball that tells me what's going to happen on a daily. It'd be a lot of days. I'd probably stay in bed. If I had a crystal ball that told me what was going to happen today, but uh, no, but that's kind of the exciting part about going out fishing every day. It's just the unknown. Yeah. Not knowing what you're do you have see any, do you have any about. opinions? Of, I mean, you'll see, you'll see guides that do guarantee. And I had a, like a, a philosophical kind of, discussion with myself when you're taking a long ride out there, you know, as a young guide and you're seeing somebody that's guaranteeing fish and they're, and they're, 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 you know, booking trips. And you I wonder if I should guarantee trips. And, you know, you're riding on one of these hour long rides and you're thinking about this. And I, I, I came up with, with my answer to that. What, what is your answer? Would you, do you think that would ever be a good idea? Um, I mean, not for me and what I do, but it, it doesn't mean that I, you know, I couldn't do that. Like I couldn't, you know, hold up to this guarantee, but 
what, I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, what does that mean? I throw my net on 500 pilchards and I'm good. Right. Well, that's what I, I, mean, I that's what I kind of got. So, so, I mean, where is the level of, well, I mean, do you guarantee me a 40 pound black? Oh no, it's just guaranteed. But I'm saying, fish. But you'll I'm never saying, see anybody but, say like, I guarantee you but, this particular fish. But, but I'm <laughs> saying to you, it, to me, it's just a marketing gimmick, but that's just my own opinion. I mean, you know, may, maybe there is somebody that guarantees I'm going to catch a 25 pound mutton. I mean, maybe there is, or, or a guarantee I'm going to catch a, you know, whatever it is, you know what I mean? But I, you know, I don't know very many friends of mine that are pretty solid cats that would say, I guarantee you to catch 150 pound tarp and don't fly. Oh man. The more you, the more you, you know go, I mean? the more you realize there is a, uh, yeah, it might happen. And you're great. You're a great fly caster. You're the best fly caster in the world. That's cool. That's probably the day that the fishing is going to be the worst when you show up. Like <laughs> I, <laughs> I've had that happen like a million times. You get so excited about this guy and you're like, man, if, we, if I get this guy on the bow, it's going to be awesome. Then it's blowing 35 and raining sideways. And you're like, yeah, well, and then the next yeah, guy man. shows up and he literally can't get it out of the boat, but he catches one. Right. And you're like, oh, okay. <laughs> that's, that's that's a strange thing, but I always thought with the, with the guaranteeing fish, I was like, you know, the cu the customer doesn't want that. Like that would be if if you see that, you should probably steer away from that because what's going to happen if if I say I'm going to guarantee fish and you're coming to me to catch bonefish, well, I'm going to make sure that we go snapper fishing for a little while first. In is that what you booked for? You wanted to go bone fishing, but I'm going to take you snapper fishing and burn up an hour or two hours of the day to make sure that you get your fish that so I get paid. You better and check then that box we're going to go bone fishing, right? And it's like the customer doesn't want that. Like they think they wouldn't want it, but that's not what you want. Like what you want is is the customer wants you. He wants a guide that is going to show up and give it his 110%, has, has your uh, enjoyment in, at top of mind and your safety at top of mind. And if you catch fish, that's going to be a bonus. And you know what? With that particular guy that has that particular attitude and has that particular uh, uh, attention to detail and has his homework done like that, your chances of catching fish are way better than the yeah, guy man. that guarantees something else. But you're that guy, Jeff. You're that guy, man. And so <laughs> I got I got a tremendous amount of respect for you. I love watching you on the dock. You 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 don't know I'm watching, but I'm watching. I see you come, I see you go, and uh, I see the happy customers get off the boat. And you don't even know this, but they're walking down talking about how great a day it was. And you're off. You've already picked up your customers, and you're 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 pulling out of the harbor. You don't know. I see all that right. when I'm when I'm right. you know doing the interviews at the at the at the place and everything else. And and you got a tremendous reputation, and, and it's well-deserved. So I appreciate uh, that. I, Thank I, you. I really uh, have enjoyed the days that we've been able to fish together and, and I've been wanting to have you on the podcast for a while. And I, I thanks for, for spending the time. Cause I know that this kind of time for you is, uh, is rare. So good. No, thing I really a appreciate rough day. It. Yeah, no, it's been awesome, Tom. It's been great to catch up and I really genuinely appreciate the opportunity to, to come on and chat with you a little bit and uh, hopefully we'll see one another again in the near future. Oh, we will tell them how to tell them how to go fishing with you. Um, Jeff at Tarpon Time. Um, Tarpentime.com is our website, so you can go on there. Uh, Jeff at Tarpentime.com is my email. Um, but uh, anytime a trip needs to get booked or reservations, uh, Tarpentime.com is where you find me. So you can go right on to Tarpentime.com. You got two boats, right? Uh, we do. Yep, we sure do. So, so I run a so. I run a 25 Dorado, and we also have a 21 Egret. Uh, my fly trips happen out of a 16 Dolphin Super Skiff, so that's also an option. All right. There, there it is. You should take advantage of that. Jeff's the man. All right, Jeff. Thanks so much, man. We'll talk to you soon and see you Thank soon. Thank you, Tom. All right. Have a nice afternoon, buddy. Take see care. Bye-bye.